Despite the many negative aspects of the Jehovah's Witnesses, there are a few positives that can be said about them. The last one has benefited me outside of the organization. However, each of the three out of these four positives does not come with caveats. This channel, like many others, subjects Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower organization to a good deal of scrutiny. While criticism exists, it's important to acknowledge that every group has its positive aspects. While some of their doctrines differ from mainstream Christianity, they also hold some positive values. Humans are social beings, wired for connection and belonging. Religious communities often fulfill this need, providing a sense of purpose, shared values, and a supportive network. And this is what draws people into religious communities. Let's explore the benefits and drawbacks of community in these harmful groups. Now, for many, Jehovah's Witnesses offer a sense of belonging they might not have found elsewhere. Isolation and loneliness, people feel uh, feeling isolated, lonely, or going through life transitions are particularly susceptible. The group offers a ready-made social circle, instant friendships, and a feeling of being part of something bigger than oneself. There's also a shared identity. Jehovah's Witnesses create a unique identity for members, setting them apart from the corrupt outside world. This shared identity fosters a sense of belonging and camaraderie. There's also acceptance and a sense of purpose. Members are often showered with love and acceptance, something they may lack in their lives. And the group provides a clear purpose and meaning, often centered around a grand mission of saving the world. However, in cults and high control groups, this community aspect takes a sinister turn. While it can initially draw people in and offer a sense of belonging and ultimately becomes a tool for manipulation and control. While the sense of community initially feels positive, it's ultimately used to control members and here's why. The us versus them mentality. Jehovah's Witnesses cultivate a strong us versus them mentality, portraying outsiders as dangerous or deceived. This isolates members from their existing support networks and makes them reliant on the group for validation. There's also information control. Information from outside sources is restricted or demonized and this keeps the members dependent on groups, on the group's teachings and leadership for their understanding of the world. Then, of course, there's the love bombing. The initial showering of love and acceptance is often a manipulative tactic called love bombing, and this creates a cycle of dependence on the group for emotional well-being. All around the world. People come together every week at places of worship called Kingdom Halls. Have you ever wondered what happens inside a Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses? It's a place where Bible study programs and lectures are held each week. The first time I attended a meeting, I felt very happy. The atmosphere was so good. I've never seen anything like it anywhere else. The people are loving, orderly, and show an interest in people. Every meeting is open to the public. Seats are free and no collections are ever taken. Families are invited to attend and learn together. All meetings begin and end with song and prayer. One meeting, usually held on the weekend, includes a 30-minute Bible discourse especially designed for the general public. After that, there's a question and answer discussion based on an article in the study edition of the Watchtower magazine. Participation is always voluntary. At one of the meetings during the week, we not only study the Bible, but also receive training in public speaking. Everyone is invited to the Christian meetings, including those who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. You can go into any Kingdom Hall and receive the same program of Bible instruction. 
Bible education, upbuilding association, and the opportunity to praise God await you at Christian Meetings of Jehovah's Witnesses. To find a Kingdom Hall near you, please visit the About Us section and fill in the Congregation Meeting search. The sense of belonging in high control groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses comes at a heavy price. Members are pressured to conform to the group's beliefs and behaviors, uh, individuality is discouraged, and critical thinking is stifled. And Jehovah's Witnesses often pressure members to se sever ties with non-believing friends and family, and this isolates individuals and makes them more susceptible to control. There's also the financial exploitation. Jehovah's Witnesses exploit members financially, demanding donations or unpaid labor. This not only weakens financial independence, but can create a sense of indebtedness to the group. The pressure to conform, combined with information control and isolation, can lead to anxiety, depression, and even post-traumatic stress disorder in victims. Morality often becomes the bedrock of religion, providing a framework for ethical behavior and a sense of purpose. Jehovah's Witnesses emphasize high moral standards, encouraging members to abstain from killing, stealing, excessive alcohol consumption, etc. And this commitment to moral living can be a positive influence on individuals and families. For some, Jehovah's Witnesses offer a clear-cut moral code in a world often perceived as ambiguous. And this can be particularly appealing to individuals who grapple with moral ambiguity. The complexities of modern life can leave people questioning right and wrong. And Jehovah's Witnesses offer a simplified moral code, providing a sense of certainty and clarity in an uncertain world. There's the desire to make a difference. Many people are drawn to cults like the JWs with a strong social justice message or a mission to improve the world. The belief that they are part of something morally superior can be a powerful motivator. A sense of shame or guilt, individuals burdened by past actions or feelings of inadequacy may be drawn to the idea of moral redemption offered by the Jehovah's Witnesses. However, Jehovah's Witnesses exploit this desire for moral certainty by defining the other. They create a clear distinction between us, the morality or the, mor the righteous, and them. Uh, this fosters a sense of self-righteousness and justifies potentially harmful actions towards non-believers. There's the black and white thinking. Thinking Complex moral issues are reduced to simple binaries, good versus evil, right versus wrong. And this allows for easier control and discourages independent thought. Moral superiority is another one. Members are led to believe they possess a unique moral understanding unavailable to outsiders. This reinforces a sense of belonging, and elevates the group's importance. Whether you're in school or not, you're probably under a lot of pressure. Not just from all the studying and those piles of homework, but pressure from other kids. Pressure to have sex, or cheat, or maybe it's to smoke or take drugs. <laughs> Of course, you know what they want you to do is bad. But at times, you may feel like you're missing out if you don't join them. You're not alone. Since the world began, young people have been dealing with peer pressure. But it doesn't mean you have to give in. The Bible has some good advice. Exodus 23.2 tells us not to just follow after the crowd. In other words, don't do something just because everyone else is doing it. Instead, be your own person. How do you get the strength to stand up to peer pressure? Here are four steps that can help. First, keep on the lookout for moral dangers and identify any situations where you might be pressured to do something wrong. If you see trouble coming your way, don't walk right into it. Find another route and avoid the problem. The second step. Stop and take the time to think. Think about the consequences before you give in to peer pressure. 
In Proverbs 14, 15, the Bible says, smart people watch their step. So don't just jump in and do what others say. That may be hard to do if you're trying to fit in, but that's the time to use your imagination. How will I feel later if I give in? What might be the outcome? How might my actions affect others that care about me the most? Step three, you need to plan ahead. Proverbs 24.5 says that a person who has knowledge increases his power. If you know exactly why you're saying no to something, why something is bad, it can give you the strength to say no. Now the fourth step, take action. No, you don't have to give your peers a lecture. Just say no, clearly and confidently. You may be surprised at their reaction. Each time you take a stand for what you know is right, you get stronger and stronger. And that makes it easier to resist the pressure the next time. You don't need to be rude, but you could give a reason why you wouldn't want to join in. And if they do keep pressuring you, just remember this. Giving in to peer pressure is kind of like being turned into a puppet with your peers pulling the strings. You can't hide from peer pressure, but you can stand up to it. Remember to keep on the lookout. Think about the consequences. Plan ahead and take action. Facing up to peer pressure can be scary at times. But when you do, you show the decisions you make really are your own. While the initial attraction to moral certainty may seem positive, it has devastating consequences. Suppression of individual morality is one, the JW Moral Code overrides individual conscience, leading members to justify actions they might otherwise find unethical, like the no blood policy. This can lead to blind obedience and participation in harmful activities. That us versus them mentality, the emphasis on moral superiority creates a culture of judgment and exclusion, and this can lead to conflict with families, friends, and the wider community. It is also guilt and shame. Because strict moral code can be used to manipulate members, leaders may exploit past mistakes or perceived transgressions to keep members compliant and guilt-driven. So, the morality promoted by Jehovah's Witnesses and cults is often a sham, masking self-serving agendas. Um, like cruel and controlling behaviors are often wrapped in a cloak of moral righteousness. Leaders may claim their actions are necessary to purify members' or save them from damnation. Um, then there's the demands for money and resources, which are often framed as a moral obligation, a way to support the group's noble cause. And this can lead to financial hardship and even poverty for members. And questioning the group's moral code is often equated with immorality. And this stifles critical thinking and allows leaders to maintain absolute control. Pacifism, the rejection of violence as a means of conflict resolution, is a philosophy with deep historical and religious roots. And one thing that the Jehovah's Witnesses like to point is that they are the only religion who do not take up arms and fight in wars. But that is not true. Other Christian sects, like the Seventh-day Adventists, the Christadelphians, the Mennonites, the Quakers, and the Amish, uh, etc., for some, these individuals, uh, these groups, offer a haven of peace and nonviolence particularly those who are disillusioned with violence and witnessing war, violence, or societal unrest can lead people to, to seek alternatives and cults that promote pacifism and seem like a peaceful refuge in a turbulent world. Then there's the moral obligation objections to violence. Those with strong ethical convictions against violence may be drawn to cults that emphasize nonviolence as a core principle. There's the desire for inner peace. Individuals seeking inner peace and freedom from anger may find the promise 
of nonviolence appealing. One of the primary benefits of pacifism um, within cults and high control groups like the Jehovah's Witness is, is its promotion of nonviolence. By advocating for peaceful conflict resolution and rejecting aggression, pacifism fosters an environment of tolerance and mutual respect. Members are encouraged to resolve disputes through dialogue and negotiation rather than resorting to physical or ver verbal violence. This commitment to nonviolence can contribute to a sense of safety and security within the group, promoting emotional well-being and interpersonal harmony. And pacifism encourages individuals to emphasize, uh, to empathize with, with others and, and approach conflicts with compassion and understanding. Within cults and high control groups, this emphasis on empathy can foster a sense of camaraderie and solidarity among members. And by prioritizing the well-being of others and practicing kindness and forgiveness, individuals can forge deeper connections and cultivate a supportive community. Now, this sense of empathy can also extend beyond the group, encouraging members to engage in acts of charity and altruism towards those in need. Passivism encourages open communication and constructive dialogue as a means of con resolving conflict. Within cults and high control groups, this approach can facilitate the resolution of disagreements and prevent escalation into more serious disputes. And by creating a space for dialogue and negotiation, passivism allows individuals to express their concerns and grievances in a peaceful manner. And this emphasis on communication can strengthen relationships within the group and promote a sense of collective problem solving. I was in the military for 13 years. Women didn't used to belong to combat regiments. I was the first to obtain the rank of sergeant in my regiment. I lived the army 24 and seven. The clothes I wore, the people I associated with, everything was military. Being in a man's field is very intimidating. I felt I had to work twice as hard, be twice as fast, and be twice as good. So I became more and more aggressive in order to accomplish the missions that were given to me. I let the pressure to perform affect me in negative ways. I did not feel anything. I used more profanity. I drank more heavily. I smoked more. It wasn't the quality of the life that I wanted. I felt that my life wasn't going anywhere. And there was a knock on the front door. It was very surprising to learn from the scriptures that I could draw close to God. But the witnesses, they explained things in a way that it made sense and I could verify all of it myself. I didn't understand what they meant by God could love you. The witnesses showed me how to look in the Bible and find out what the Bible said about it all. It gave me a desire to keep going, and things started to get a lot better. When I put down my rifle and I picked up a Bible, those around me, they didn't understand it at all. It's worth everything just to show someone that they can be loved. Just to watch that change is fabulous. It's only with a lot of prayer and meditation that I was able to change my personality. Jehovah guides me. If you put your anxiety on Him, He will give you that peace. My husband is my joy. He's showing me the patience and the loving kindness that Jehovah wants families to experience. The members of my congregation are my family. They are my brothers and sisters. I now have a huge worldwide family. We have a lovely 
lovely congregation. And to be able to laugh and joke and to talk about Jehovah, it's wonderful. When I was in the military, I became a very dark and uncaring person. Jehovah has taught me how to beat my sword into a plowshare. He taught me that I didn't need to learn war anymore. And while the principle of pacifism often aligns with ideals of harmony and cooperation, its implementation within these contexts can sometimes lead to detrimental consequences. On a surface level, surface level uh, commitment to nonviolence may initially appear positive. It's often used to control members, suppress their dissent, and shield the group's harmful activities. The pacifism promoted by Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults is often a sham because they mask a reality of uh, manipulation and deception. Um, they, just, uh, they justify authoritarianism. Leaders may claim their absolute control is necessary to maintain peace within the group. And this stifles free thought and, of course, individual agency. Violence against dissenters, despite uh, the outward pacifism, cults may employ intimidation tactics or emotional abuse to silence dissenters. This creates a climate of fear and discourages questioning of the leadership. Then there's also the indirect violence. Now, while physical violence may be discouraged, cults can inflict lasting emotional and psychological harm on members through isolation and manipulation and gaslighting. Now, pacifism is a beautiful ideal in its purest form and becomes a weapon in the hands of cult leaders. Public speaking is a skill highly valued within Jehovah's Witness communities as members are trained to effectively communicate their beliefs and engage with others through door-to-door -door ministry. Both men and women alike are trained from a young age to speak in public. I was, given, uh, I was giving talks from about 12 years old and even did demonstrations and interviews at assemblies and conventions in, in front of thousands of people. And when I'm asked by many outsiders what is the one thing I take away from the Jehovah's Witnesses, it is the fact that they have taught me to speak publicly. And this was eventually honed in my professional career as well. Now, public speaking training within Jehovah's Witness uh, communities provides members with the opportunities to overcome fear and build confidence in their ability to articulate their beliefs. Through regular practice and feedback, members learn to express themselves clearly and persuasively, strength, strengthening their confidence both in public settings and in their personal interactions. And Jehovah's Witnesses emphasize the importance of effective, uh, of effective communication in conveying their message to others. Now, public speaking training equips their members with essential communication skills, such as organizing their thoughts, using persuasive language, and engaging their audience. And these skills are valuable not only in door-to-door -door ministry, but also in various aspects of everyday life, including professional settings. Uh, social interactions, and personal relationships. And effective public speaking goes beyond delivering a message. It also involves uh, actively listening to and, in, and empathizing with the audience. Jehovah's Witnesses training empath emphasizes the importance of understanding the perspectives and concerns of those they interact with, fostering empathy and compassion towards others. Now, by owning their listening skills and seeking to connect with individuals on a personal level, Members can build meaningful relationships and facilitate open dialogue with diverse audiences. And public speaking is a highly sought after skill in the professional world with applications across various industries and roles. And members who leave the Jehovah's Witness community can leverage their public speaking skills to advance their careers, whether through delivering presentations, uh, participating in meetings, or networking with colleagues and clients. And effective communication is often cited as one of the key factors in career success. And individuals with strong public speaking skills are well positioned to excel in their chosen fields. Public speaking is closely associated with leadership. 
as effective leaders must be able to inspire and motivate others through their words. Members believe the Jehovah's Witnesses community may find opportunities to assume leadership roles in their workplaces, in their communities, or in social circles, drawing on their public speaking skills to influence and empower others. Whether leading team meetings, facilitating workshops, or advocating for causes they believe in, individuals with strong public speaking skills can make a positive impact as leaders in various domains. Beyond professional and social benefits, public speaking skills can empower individuals on a personal level, enabling them to express themselves confidently and assertively, and members who leave the Jehovah's Witnesses community might find that their public speaking abilities uh, enhance their self-esteem, their resilience, and sense of agency as well. And by sharing their experiences, their perspectives, and passions with others, individuals can cultivate a stronger sense of identity and purpose and reclaiming their voice and autonomy in the process. Healthy communities and organizations offer genuine support without manipulation. Um, and they encourage critical thinking. Uh, members should be free to question and discuss their beliefs. Uh, they respect boundaries. They don't isolate you from family and friends. Uh, they promote financial responsibility. Giving, uh, giving is volu voluntary, not pressured. They also value individual's growth. Uh, you, are, you are encouraged to pursue your own interests and talents. So the issues I've raised in this video are very nuanced. Let me know what you think in the comments below.